there's a lot of guidelines and there's 35 guideline recommendations in this. Um, this talk was provided courtesy of the guidelines panel. Uh, so I'll try to go appropriately through things that we need to and slow down and pause where I think it's important. So the treatment of non-metastatic muscle invasive bladder cancer was kind of a composite guideline of AUA, ASCO, ASTRO, and SUO. So that gives it a little more credence. Uh, still not converted to the NCCN at all with it, partly due to the fact that the methodology is a little higher bar for these type of guidelines than it would be for NCCN. So these guidelines contain sort of soup to nuts, purpose, methodology, background, the guideline statements, and uh, even wrap up with pretty user-friendly algorithms that all of you can have access to. We know that muscle invasive bladder cancer is present in about a quarter of all patients who present with bladder cancer. And the risk of death from this disease is not trivial. Uh, I'd like to think that all of our efforts have really moved the needle, but when you look at it critically, you could make the argument that we really haven't gone very far in terms of improving outcomes of patients with invasive bladder cancer in terms of uh, their survival because of the fact that many times they present late, we have limitations to the systemic therapies that we give with partial response rates, but rarely complete. Our surgery can accomplish some things, but not all. So those are some sobering thoughts and, and you know, certainly reason to do additional trials. Uh, the guideline provides risk stratification, clinical framework, and hopefully uh, guidance to all of us in terms of how to manage these patients. Like all the guidelines, there's a pretty stringent methodology that goes into it. They tend to compartmentalize uh, these studies that are done into A, B, or C based on the level of evidence that's there, best or the A's, just like when you were in school. Um, the methodology also then gets a recommendation, and those are sort of gradated too, and there's a little more nuance to that, and uh, you don't have time or, you know, really to read it all, but suffice it to say that if it's a really well done study, that it really applies to most patients and it's unlikely to change in the near future, it's going to get a very strong recommendation if the study was done well. On the other hand, if uh, there's no apparent benefit or harm, you can't tell, that's more of a conditional recommendation. And then those moderate recommendations are kind of in the middle. It's a good study, but other studies are going to come forward and likely it's going to change in the near future. They also have wiggle room because everything we do isn't based on randomized clinical trials. So things like clinical principle, and you'll see plenty of those throughout the guidelines. Those are even things as basic as you should do a physical exam, you should stage people. There's no randomized trials of no staging versus staging, but everybody believes that's something you should do, giving least toxic to more toxic therapies, another example. So there is some interpretation of these guidelines. Not everything is, is uh, high level evidence. We've already seen the epidemiology, but this is a fairly common cancer. Really, in our practices, it's, a, it's probably the most common cancer if you really take care of a lot of oncology patients because of the recurrence and the prevalence of the disease in the non-invasive space. However, with invasive disease, about 25% of these newly diagnosed patients will have it, and it remains a fairly lethal disease. Prognosis is almost directly related to staging of the cancer, and especially based on pathologic staging, we do pretty well with patients who have truly organ-confined disease. You saw Dr. Petrolak put up the really good, the best survival is, you know, no residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery. Those patients have a 90 to 95 percent survival rate. On the other hand, as the stage increases and certainly as node positivity starts to enter into the equation, we don't do so well. We still can cure a few patients with that first echelon of node positive disease, but we really don't win the game when it's widely metastatic. A case that's been presented, a 73-year-old gentleman presents with hematuria, undergoes a cystoscopy, and looks like he has muscle invasive disease. The disease looks sessile. Like many patients in this category, he has some comorbidities, diabetes, coronary artery disease, hypertension. He had a remote history of a DVT. Um, he smokes, he's a current smoker, uh, and there's no family history. Not a remarkable exam. Uh, his laboratory testing, he has a creatinine of 1.4, which adjusted his EGFR as 51. So it's not in that completely uh, go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy based on that. 
So the next steps, he undergoes a TRBT, an exam under anesthesia, doesn't have any disease outside the confines of his bladder based on imaging. And so then you get into some of the nuts and bolts of the guidelines. So suffice it to say, you need to do a good history and physical exam, that they get examined with a TUR, you get tissue diagnosis, um, they get a complete staging workup, and that can be challenging sometimes if they have poor renal function, usually have to revert to an MRI, and it's a little suboptimal, but um, it is better probably than not. And uh, most patients will have normal renal function and can get cross-sectional imaging with contrast. The pathology report reveals a muscle invasive tumor, and as so many of our patients these days, there's variant histology. Um, a lot of the devil in the detail is what's the percentage of that variant histology. If it's a small percentage, most of those patients are, one, eligible for clinical trials if they're available, and two, are generally treated as if they were um, pure urothelial. There are some exceptions, and we'll show those at, at the end there. Um, initial patient evaluation, uh, if they have one of those variant histologies, especially if it looks like it's predominant, it's best to have that reviewed. You may have that expertise in your backyard and they feel comfortable with things like nested variant, plasma cytoid, micropapillary, but if you don't, that's worth getting it sent out. In invasive disease, it can matter as to whether or not they might respond to chemotherapy or that sort of thing. In non-invasive disease, it can be really critical. So when you start getting these kind of unusual path reports, please do your best to try and make sure that you think the pathologist that's doing it isn't trying to, you know, sort of overcommit himself to something he's not familiar with. For patients with newly diagnosed disease uh, that's invasive, curative treatment options should be discussed. It seems to be, you know, that seems pretty intuitive. Uh, favoring a multidisciplinary approach. So, for example, when I have a patient with newly diagnosed muscle invasive disease, it's very common for them to see a medical oncologist as well and discuss chemotherapy. Um, th those are just kind of basic tenets. It's a clinical principle, but patients usually do better. Does everyone see a radiation oncologist? No, they don't in my center. I don't know what they do at your place. But very few patients that we see are true ideal candidates outside of a clinical trial for bladder preserving with radiation. Prior, treatment, prior to treatment, they should be counseled regarding the complications, and those should not be underscored, as well as the impact of this operation on the quality of life. I mean, I, I would love to see in our lifetime that we never do another cystectomy. I've done more than 1,000 of them, and you start looking at the ravages that the surgery puts on patients. It doesn't matter if it's minimally invasive and robotic, all intracorporeal diversion, or an open surgery. Uh, it is a life-changing event, and even when the surgery goes really well, sometimes the patients fall apart. And so that is very humbling, and I just, you know, hope that we could come up with something better than this type of thing. And it's more morbid than a colorectal surgery, just removing the colon or traditional bowel surgery just something about the whole enchilada that makes it a very morbid, potentially morbid thing. Quality of life considerations play into effect, in, in, uh, including the diversion, which we'll get to in a little bit, but I think a lot has to be spent on the impact that this operation is going to have. And if you're not doing that, then you probably shouldn't be doing cystectomies because on a, on a good day, five to seven days in the hospital, um, on a bad day, much longer. Readmission rates from the initial surgery still remain around 25 to 30 percent. Um, you know, lots of potential complications along the way, including thromboembolic. That's why it's recommended to continue that prophylaxis for 30 days, not just seven or not just till they're out of the hospital. So there's a variety of things that can, can happen, and I think it's important they know what they're getting into. We've covered this well, so we'll just gloss over the fact that it is recommended that patients be considered for cisplatinum-based chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting, and we covered that earlier. Um, the panel advocated the importance of platinum in that chemo. Uh, there are many places where alternatives to cisplatinum are given, and again, we, we, we touched on this, but uh, carboplatinum, for example, just doesn't get you the same uh, benefit, and it may actually be harmful to delay three to four months uh, potential curative surgery. So best regimens have been well covered, but it includes a platinum base, whether it's in that compressed time frame of the neoadjuvant or it's um, with dose-dense MVAC or whether it's uh, GEMSYS. 
hearing loss. And I don't know if Dan wants to comment on this a little bit later, because I'm not sure I fully understand, but they're testing everybody for hearing loss, and there's some degree, but I don't know what that is, where they will not give it. So we had a patient who had one, he got punched in the ear when he was younger, so he can't hear one ear. They wouldn't give him chemotherapy because they were afraid that it would destroy his hearing in the other ear. Um, so these are more subtle things, but they're being looked at now. So I'd like to kind of hear his perspective on that later. Back to the case, the patient sees an oncologist, and I think it was based on his uh, renal function. He was deemed not to be a good candidate for platinum-based chemotherapy. And so uh, another therapy was recommended, but not by us. And so we believe, and the guidelines support this, that they should not prescribe that alternative carboplatinum. I hope someday we have a menu of immune-based and checkpoint inhibitors and other therapies that we can offer patients that are tailor-made for their tumors, but we don't have that yet. Clinicians should perform radical cystectomy as soon as possible following the patient's completion. There's been a lot of um, work that's being done and a little bit that has been done in a thoughtful fashion on um, increasing their performance status, increasing their nutritional status before surgery. So you're sort of on the clock, you're giving them chemotherapy, the uh, patients often are malnourished, and, and so there are some studies, uh, one that we just published, one that uh, others have published in a new SWOG study that's going to look at the um, value of adding nutritional supplements for a time uh, then moving forward with it. Now, we don't know the optimal duration. It could only be six or eight weeks in the life of a 70-year-old person, but if we can um, increase their nutrition through some of these supplements, we might reduce some of the complications like wound, healing, et cetera, infectious complications. Um, so then you move forward with uh, the plan uh, based on um, when you can do it, but six to eight weeks is, is kind of generally the accepted. Um, eligible patients who have not received cisplatinum-based chemotherapy and have non-organ confined disease, then after the surgery, so T3, T4, node positive, should be offered another visit to the oncologist to consider adjuvant chemotherapy and or clinical trial. So we looked at that other composite of the meta-analysis and there was some benefit if you put all the studies together, but the level of evidence isn't great for adjuvant chemotherapy we don't know if that's because the therapy doesn't work as well in that setting or whether it just the truth is that it's just not going to work as well. But um, we, I think they should, and there are good trials ongoing looking at some of the new agents like the checkpoint inhibitors in the adjuvant setting. Clinicians should also offer radical cystectomy with no dissection for surgically eligible patients with resectable non-metastatic disease. Um, so that, that seems to be a pretty straightforward recommendation. Um, there is debate about how many organs you take out with the bladder, but the standard party line would be in a man, a radical cystectomy includes removal of his prostate and seminal vesicles, and in a woman, it generally includes the anterior vaginal wall, uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries. Um, there are exceptions to that, so when there's concern over uh, sexual function and, and the tumor location is amendable to it, certainly can do organ preserver, preserving um, around the uh, bladder, and, and certainly we've done that in selected cases. So back to the case, um, the patient now has decided he can't have chemotherapy, but he wants surgery. Um, what type of diversion would you offer? And again, the discussion with these patients should include both continent and incontinent diversion, ileal conduits, neobladders, continent cutaneous diversion is part of the discussion. Now, just like with chemotherapy, there'll be some absolute contraindications to doing continent diversion, such as poor renal function or lack of dexterity, but they should be discussed, and then if they are candidates for it, you want to kind of give them both sides of the coin so they'll know. Um, I think that our, in the United States, for a variety of reasons, uh, our rates of like neobladders seem lower than selected centers in Europe. I think there may be some obvious selection bias, but also I think there are some probably underutilization due to it's harder, the postoperative care is more complicated, et cetera. Clinicians should attempt to optimize their performance status, and this gets back to a little bit about the nutritional counseling. There's other people doing exercise to try and incur weight training, things like that. 
We don't do a good job about that. We really just say, you have this disease, go see the anesthesiologist, go see your heart doctor, and we'll get you on the table. Um, but we need to do a better job with that. Smoking cessation is important. And then the whole uh, thing around ERAS pathways has really improved uh, to some degree. The uh, recovery period, it's hasten the time in the hospital, but that's only the first hospitalization. Um, and if we don't do a good job through the continuum of their care, then they're gonna be right back in the hospital with more problems. Um, this was uh, an, an additive to most people's ERAS pathway, and that's the use of these mu opioid antagonists. Um, Entereg was the study that was done in bladder cancer looking at reducing the length of stay with the use of this. Obviously, if they're on pain medicines or opioids before they come to the hospital, they're not eligible for it. If they have severe coronary disease, they're not eligible for it. But it does increase the uh, uh, transit time and returns bowel function quicker. Um, patients should also undergo some form of preoperative counseling for the diversion, as well as in, during the hospital before discharge, and then they'll need assistance with it upon discharge. The role of pelvic lymphadenectomy is believed to be important for both staging and in some cases it can be therapeutic. Um, so a strong recommendation to perform the lymphadenectomy, although the level of what constitutes a um, adequately performed pelvic lymphadenectomy is debated. Um, so there's no consensus as we sit here today on how high you should go. Some people go even above the um, aortic bifurcation. Others include the common iliac, and then the, the sort of the minimal would be at least the uh, internal iliacs, the obturator, as well as the external iliacs. While I was making this talk, uh, there's a study that just came out in um, European urology, so you can see it in press but not you know, published yet, but it was a randomized study. And there's a couple of these coming down the pike looking at extended lymph node versus traditional lymph node dissection. At least in this one, if you were going to go back and re-review the guidelines, there wasn't really a survival benefit in terms of an extended node versus a traditional one, but there were higher rates of complications such as lymphocytes. Um, so there's also another study ongoing in the U.S. that would, should shed some light on that too. Um, for patient selection, uh, patients with newly diagnosed non-metastatic disease who desire to retain their bladder, um, and for those with significant comorbidities like we talked about um, that, uh, a little while ago that are just too sick or too frail, then there are alternatives to radical cystectomy and they should be offered a bladder preserving pathway. Um, the panel's preferred approach was kind of a complete TUR if possible addition of systemic therapy and radiation therapy, um, and then periodic reassessments to cystoscopically evaluate their response to therapy. Um, in patients considering bladder preservation, again, the TUR is really a critical part of it. Um, patients with uh, multifocal disease, CIS, the trigone location, some of those kind of things can make it extremely difficult to get you know, great response rates, but to the best you can, you should perform a complete TUR. Patients with muscle invasive disease who are medically fit and consent to radical cystectomy should not undergo partial cystectomy or maximum TUR. So if you can have a cystectomy with rare circumstances, um, you should undergo a cystectomy, not just do the partial. Uh, it's kind of like uh, when they asked Vince Lombardi why he didn't pass on third down. Three things can happen and two of them are bad. So recurrences in the bladder that have to then undergo a second cystectomy or metastatic disease because you didn't control the primary. And there are exceptions, things like um, adenocarcinomas in the dome and some special circumstances like that. But for most part, partial uh, cystectomy was thought to be inferior to radical cystectomy. Number 24, uh, for patients with muscle invasive disease, clinicians should not offer radiation therapy alone. So it was felt that combining it with a radiosensitizing chemotherapy or systemic, traditional systemic chemotherapy would be superior and result in better control. For patients with muscle invasive disease who elect multimodality therapy with bladder preservation, they should undergo uh, that radical TUR and then um, undergo those planned reassessments and in those patients, they do mention platinum and 5-FU, which we talked about earlier, as well as mitomycin. Um, in patients that are found to recur on these bladder-preserving therapies, now if it's a non-invasive recurrence, they can undergo traditional non-invasive 
um, intravesical therapies, but in patients who have truly an invasive recurrence, those patients should move on to cystectomy if indeed they were a candidate. Um, trying to finish this up, uh, there, there are really expert opinion type things on how to surveil patients after cystectomy. In general, six to 12 month uh, checks that include laboratory testing as well as imaging because you're not only following surveillance for their bladder cancer, but you're also assessing um, their upper tract. So those are all considerations. Um, the, uh, there's no consensus though on exactly how often to do it. We know that most recurrences occur within the first two years, but it doesn't end there. And so you should at least follow patients out pretty vigilantly to that five-year mark. Uh, survivorship is included in the guidelines, and most patients are, there's a lot of brochures out there to give them things like Beacon makes nice brochures for bladder cancer. Uh, there's local community support groups that include web-based and Facebook type of things. Um, and again, healthy lifestyle, just like prostate cancer, patients should be um, offered those type of things. We already talked about variant histology, but it's important to recognize it. Things like small cell neuroendocrine, they need chemotherapy before any treatment. Things like micropapillary may not be responsive, kind of depends on who you look at, but the idea would be that uh, you would want to highlight that, micro that, that variant pathology and then make a referral to consider alternative treatments. And they include a little section on future research which hopes for better detection, better markers, improved therapy, including this immune therapy that we've just heard about, and then better ways to surveil patients. There's algorithms in there that you saw, just like for the non-invasive that Dr. Castle showed, they've got them for invasive disease too. So that's a lot of information, 35 guidelines, but I think we've uh, well covered some of the nuances of invasive bladder cancer and its management. Um, I thank you for your attention. And